Frank J. Avella here with Awards Daily. Today in our Oscar Legends series, we have simply one of cinema's greatest directors, Academy Award winner James Ivory. Welcome, James. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Jim, I have to tell you, I have spent the entire month of January re-watching almost every film. I think I didn't get to two. Uh, what a stunning body of work. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to start by asking about uh, Stephen Susie's uh, wonderful documentary, Merchant Ivory. Um, were you pleased with the final work? Um, in almost every way, yes. If 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 I said no, if I say no, not quite, that means that something's not there that I would have had there. That's what that means. So you know, but yeah, in general, I was very pleased. Uh, was there anything in uh, the doc that surprised you? Anything that anybody said? Now, there were plenty of things that surprised me. <laughs> I mean, in, in, innumerable things yeah well you know uh it, it the documentary showcases a lot of the wonderful actors that you've worked with you and ismail were able to cast seasoned veterans working at the top of their game as well as all these promising newcomers who would go on to great success <laughs> were, were you aware of this family that you were forming and and what are your thoughts now looking back well, a little bit, yes. I mean, um, I, I think all directors have families, and they have people they like to work with, and and they go back to them again and again because it's, it's they've enjoyed it, and the and the 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 actors are extremely talented for what they want. So, yeah, I, I'm like that. I'm like anybody. Oh, well, you were really forthcoming discussing some of your personal life in the documentary and also in in solid ivory. Well, we're not going to do we are not going to do that today. No, because if you want to know about my personal life, you can read my book. Exactly, which I have. Better still, go and buy the book and then read it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but in your book, you're pretty honest about writing about your relationship with Ismail and this incredible professional relationship that you had. What drew you to him on that level? Well, he was—I was, uh, don't know. He—he—he he, he, he just—he was a uh, an up-and-coming producer, and the, what I needed was an up-and-coming producer. I think I'd been producing my own films, which were documentaries, and uh, and then uh, I had thought in the future that someday I will probably want to. Do, do feature films and I mean, uh, you know, not documentaries, and um, and there he was and offered me that chance. Amazing. Um, well, uh, he, wanted, he wanted to make he wanted to make the householder, and he 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 had an, an idea to do that as uh, make that as his first feature. Yeah, it's an amazing film, which I'll, I'll talk about later. Uh, I, I'm curious, when did you first fall in love with film and, and with filmmaking? Well, I've been, you know, I started going to the movies when I was five years old or something. So when I, I, fall, I don't know if it was falling in love, but I, I, I was always going to films and seeing movies as a child and growing up. And I, I always liked going to the movies and, and, uh, and then at a certain point, when I was about uh, uh, 16, 17, uh, with college not far off, um, I thought, well, what I would like to do probably is to design sets for films. I've always been interested in, in uh, architecture and uh, uh, settings and interior design and all of that. It was all always of interest to me, and, and I thought... That would be a way of, of but uh, I could combine that with my uh, enjoy, enjoyment of films. You know, it's it's funny. There are many things that come to mind when we think of a, a James Ivory movie, a Merchant Ivory film, period, adaptation, starry cast, amazing costumes. But um, I want to talk a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit about this later too. I want to talk about the, the, the Pretty Boys. 
Um, something that we don't discuss a lot. Uh, they're, they're very attractive women and men in your films. And from an early age, uh, you know, there's a certain sensibility about your movies too, but the men in James Irie films are talented, they're stunning, they're sexy. First of all, thank you for that. Growing up, you know, a little confused, uh, to, to see these beautiful men on screen was extraordinary. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I wasn't thinking of them in that way. I mean, or or, or in, in a way that, I mean, all directors want a handsome leading man. I mean, they don't, you don't want an ugly leading man. But but lately, uh, ugly leading men are also interesting. So, um, yeah, that's, you, 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 you look for good looking men, of course you do. Um, I, so I searching for the good-looking man and then hope he can act. You find someone that you know can act, and then you you pick from among them. And so many of your supporting players too. Um, so, uh, Jim, I usually structure my film discussions chronologically, but I'm going to take a, a different uh, a, a way here. I want to start with what I consider the most underrated James Ivory movies. Uh, I want to start with Mr. and Mrs. Bridge, which I think is um, one of uh, an incredible film. Um, can you speak a little bit about bringing that movie to the screen? It's, it's an interesting uh, uh, story. Um, I, I read <clears throat> I read the Mrs. Bridge book and then the Mr. Bridge book. Actually, I read them in in, in India. And um, I, 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 uh, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd read a review or something that says I thought, well, that would be interesting for me to read. It's, it seems to be rather autobiographical in a sense. It's a kind of, it's a kind of family and uh, small, small town. Though Kansas City was not a small town, but it's a sort of, it was my world. And, um, and I, so I read those books in India, and then. I gave them to Ruth to read. First, I gave Mrs. Bridge to Ruth to read, and then later on, Mr. Bridge. And I, I said, you know, this I bet this would make an interesting film. Why don't we think about it? And she answered back, probably by letter, because we uh, she usually was thousands of miles away. And she answered back, no, I don't think so. This is the, I don't think this is something for us. It doesn't seem like it. Um, uh, and then... And then I read Mr. Bridge, and um, and then I, I I said I'm really interested in doing this, and and um, by now she sort of changed her mind, and she said eventually after we had done that that uh, that, that we, after we'd combined the two novels into into one a screenplay, um, she said that of that she had really loved. You know, writing that screenplay, and that she, um, uh, um, well, well, one of the reasons she liked it was there's no, there's almost no dialogue in, in Mrs. Bridge or Mr. Bridge, and um, so that was a pleasure for her to be able to create all the dialogue, the necessary dialogue. And of course, Ruth is not an American, but she by the, this time had knew many, many Americans. She knew me. Um, so she was able to write American dialogue, and and if it hadn't really struck, well, and and also uh, Evan Connell was still around then, and Evan Connell was really part of all of this. I mean, he he was right there at our sides, you could say. Um, so you know, I want I, I wanted to do it, but but it didn't seem to be. It, it was sort of difficult to. Uh, find anybody who uh, we, we could interest in these books. And then it turned out that uh, um, Joanne Woodward was going to be doing Mrs. Bridge for television. And I just happened to be having, I say happened to be having dinner. I was uh, with Paul and Joanne, but I, and that's what, really what happened. Um, uh, I was having dinner with them, and and Joanne said, "Well, that she was going to do Mrs. Bridge for television," and um, 
then I said, well, what about why, what if we made it into a, a feature film? And, 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 uh, and then Paul at that point said, and I'll be Mr. Bridge, just like that. He hadn't read anything. He just said, I'll be Mr. Bridge. So, wow. um, and that's how it came about. And well, once you had Paul and Joanne, it wasn't that difficult to raise the money for it. But uh, up until that point, it, it was an impossible idea you know so that's what happened and um wow and woodward was amazing they they, they, they offered the well, joanne was already sort of involved with it and and paul because she was involved with it and because i wanted to do it he, he said well i'll do it too that was like that and of course isma was always there he he was keen to do it it was incredible getting the, and it was their last feature together. And I, Woodward got a bunch of award nominations, but Newman's performance is just as good. He's extraordinary. I know that. I feel that also. I feel that, 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 that something like that happened with another film of mine, which is The Bostonians. And I feel that Christopher Reeve was never, ever um, given the due for his performance of Basil Ransom in, 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 in that film. I mean, he should have. And so it was with Paul here. Um, he, he wasn't, I don't know, it, it, it wasn't the Paul Newman that everybody wanted to see. Now, uh, uh, nor was it the Christopher Reeve that everybody wanted to see in the Bostonians. They had a different idea about who the, the kinds of characters these their, their favorite actors should play. And um, so in that kind of way, they, 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 I don't know, they just couldn't accept them, perhaps, in those kinds of roles. Mm, which is unfortunate. Them. But I think, I think people are going to rediscover it because it's just, it's just, it's, it's an extraordinary film. Well, I, yeah, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably my favorite film of all my films. Um, and I think it's, possibly because it is so biographical and auto you could say autobiographical or whatever you know however you want to put it uh and i think that's one of the reasons that i am so drawn to it i want to jump back a year to 1989 another underappreciated film slaves of new york yeah, true. I thought that movie captured janowitz's world so well and i loved your use of split screen too Oh yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I better watch that again. <laughs> I always liked it very much. I thought it was, uh, uh, and and well, we 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 made it at the height of our, you could say, the height of Merchant Ivorydom, um, when we we got everything together. I mean, the, uh, you know, well, the screenwriting obviously, and then we had wonderful cameramen, and we had great set designers, and great costume designers. We had a remarkable uh, hair stylist who knew everything about hair uh, and so on. <laughs> so it, that was great, but that was it made it the peak of Merchant Ivory's know-how. Uh, and and uh, in, you had Adam Coleman Howard, who I think did a really great job. Nick Corey, who did an incredible job in that film too. Yes, I did. Yeah, uh, Adam Coleman Howard called me the other day, and I wasn't here to take the call, uh, but someone did talk to him, and and he he said in that call that I had somehow changed his life. Now I don't know how how that could be, except that I gave him the lead. I gave him the lead, so and perhaps that changed his life and led to other leads. I, I'm not sure. That's that's wonderful. Uh, do you, do you think that the re a critical reaction to slaves had anything to do with how dare you tackle something contemporary when you know you would made period films? You know the kinds of things that I heard was that, oh uh, th those nice boys who made a room with a view, uh, you know, and that they would and then they would make something like this, talking about Tama's story. I mean, I just I hated that. Yeah, yeah, it's so single minded. But then, the, you know, the film it did not do well at the box office. It was a, uh, it was a studio film, um, and it, you know, I think they had higher hopes for it, but it didn't do well. 
Well, it was so damned by the critics. It couldn't do well, I suppose. It's another one that needs to be rediscovered. Um, and and also, A Soldier's Daughter Never Cries is the next film I wanted to talk about. Well, um, well that's, that's the other favorite autobiographical film. Yes, I love that film. And I mean, that that pretty much was, um, th th that was accepted. Uh, people did, did like that, yeah, very much. I want to specifically ask you about the Francis character played by Anthony Roth Costanzo. Uh, he's the, such one of the most interesting characters uh, and way before his time in terms of queer teen representation. Um, where did you find Anthony and uh, do you know what he's doing now? I know uh, everybody should know what he's doing. He's one of the stars of the Metropolitan Opera. Oh my God, wow. I mean, yeah, I mean, and he, um, um, I, I needed, I, I needed a young musician, some kind of young musician for that film, and so he came to see me uh, with his mother. So, well, he was fifteen, and um, I wanted a young violinist for the film. I hadn't thought of a singer, mm -hmm. and then he handed me a tape, and he said, "You may want to listen to this." And so I did listen to it, and well, it was remarkable, it was extraordinary. I remember I I, I listened to it the dr driving up here to the country from New York, and I put that tape in my in, in the car radio, or a car, you know, the tape machine, and I listened to that. I thought, oh my God, I, he's I've got to have a young singer. This 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 boy is fantastic. He is. He was a remarkable boy, and um, so I. Just, just changed the part from a violinist to a singer. It's an incredible, um, it's an honestly an incredible role. It's an incredible character uh, right. for anybody who ever felt different, you know? <laughs> uh, so um, quartet. Quartet is next because I love quartet. It's I love another Annie favorite. Cash. You're hitting all my favorite films. Yes, quartet oh. is another favorite film. Uh, of mine. It was our first French film. And um, I love that film. And it was a, a great pleasure to make. And we made it in 1980. Um, and we went and spent quite a lot of time in Paris making it. Yeah. And I heard you wrote the porn scene. Is that true? Wrote the porn scene? Yeah. Well, it wasn't, you didn't really write it. But yeah, I, I, well, I, it's, yeah, I, I put it in the film, sure. Because I wanted more of the Pierre Clemente character. I found him so fascinating that that little little moment was just so interesting. I thought it could have been but a wasn't film. He great? It was fantastic. Yeah. yeah, Pierre Clemente, he was. He had <laughs> appeared in uh, quite a number of uh, avant-garde movies before then. What was he like to work with? He was great. I mean, he, he was a, very enjoyable to work with. Yeah. Absolutely fine. And that was Maggie Smith's first um, Merchant Ivory film, and she's it was. Ama amazing yep. in it. Yeah. Yep. Was she your first choice? Um, I don't, I, I think we hadn't gotten that far, but then Ismail, she was, I think she was appearing in, in, in the theater over here or in Canada. And Ismail just happened to be in that part of the world, and he just dropped in on her one day. And, and found her in her dressing room or something. That's the sort of thing Ismail could do, would do all the time. I mean, he would drop in on people in the dressing room or wherever and, and say, you've got to be in my film and so on. And that's what he did with her. And we were at that time thinking about Quartet. And so he offered her the script then and there and she, and she accepted it then and there. So, I mean, I didn't really... I hadn't really thought very much uh, at that point of uh, who would play that part. Yeah. I mm. um, want to talk about Roseland now, which, and and in particular, the second story, The Hustle, because I don't think it gets enough credit for how, how good it is. You had Walken right before The Deer Hunter. You had Geraldine Chaplin right after Nashville. And you had Helen Gallagher delivering this amazing performance. Yeah. Yeah. And, can you, can you speak a little bit about working with her? Well, it was just a great pleasure, always. I mean, she just was 
So it was just wonderful. I mean, I, and I had no, I hadn't really made an American film like that. I had made other American films before that, but I had not really made something of that sort that really required that kind of acting. I think it's lovely. Um, Jane Austen in Manhattan, 1980. This is uh, with uh, the great Ann Baxter. Um, how did this one come about? Because this this was another detour for you. Uh, well, that came about because of the English. It came about because of Hullabaloo over Georgie and Bonnie's pictures, which uh, was made for London Weekend Television. And uh, we made it in India. And uh, that was a, a, an enormous hit. And um, so I heard that they were, uh, again, th thinking of doing another uh, an, an, another film and, and, and based on a, uh, it, it was to be based on a, on um, a, a little play or something, something of the sort that, uh, that, that someone had the rights to. And, and, and so I, I said, well, what is that little play? Can I see that little play? And would it be something that we, we could develop and turn into something? And, and it, it was a little, it was just a little fragment supposedly written by Jane Austen. Well, it was, I mean, Jane Austen had actually written a kind of childhood play to entertain her family or something of the sort. And this, these little scraps was that play. And I read it and um, there wasn't much there that you that you really, you, you, <laughs> you, you would want to dramatize, but still, you know, it was by, by Jane Austen. And um, London Weekend Television decided that they were going to, to do something with it. And, and so we had already made uh, um, Hullabaloo over Georgie and Bonnie's pictures with them. And we said, well, let, let us do the Jane Austen thing, too. And they said, well, OK, you want to. Um, <laughs> so we, 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 that's how it came about. And you had, um, we got, we got, yeah, we got back sort of to, to play, to play the part there. Yeah. yeah. Good performances in, in there, including Kurt Johnson, you know, again, these, these wonderful supporting actors who never get enough credit for, you know, how good they are. Right. And he died of, of AIDS, I believe. He did not too long after that. That's right. He did. Yeah. I want to jump ahead now to the white countess. Um, you had Ray Fiennes there and Natasha Richardson, who are both extraordinary, and you were the only one who got three Redgraves in the same film. Do you realize that? Yeah, I know. Uh, and that was Ismail's final film. Can you speak a little bit about how that came about? Because that was Ishiguru, who you had already worked right. With. Well, um, I I had already worked with 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 him, and. Then I knew that he was writing a that he was writing a screenplay, and um, I just asked to to see it, and he sent it to me, and um, it was a it, it was a, but what I had done is I I had another idea for a, a film that I wanted him to write, um, and it, it was. Based on a, a a Japanese novel called the Di Diary of a, a Diary of a Mad Old Man, and I wanted to I wanted to some transform that into some kind of th thing that I can do. It, it took place in the United States and in Japan, and I wanted to somehow. And I gave him that I gave him that novel to read, and he read it, and he said, "Okay, yeah, he would he would write a screenplay." And um, he did write a screenplay, but, but uh, it wasn't that. It was something utterly, utterly, utterly different. And it was set in Shanghai, and it was at the time of the, the Japanese invasion of China and, and, and the, the bombardment of Shanghai and all that kind of thing. And it was something that, that Ishiguro had in mind. To, he was working on something of that sort anyway. Uh, and had written a novel uh, that uh, had that kind of material, and and, um, and he did seven. There were seven rewrites, and we've never that that's never happened before. But he did seven rewrites of the, of the White Countess until I was finally satisfied. 
and got what I wanted, and I guess got, he got what he wanted. And then we made it. And um, um, it, it wasn't it wasn't that difficult, really, to get the money for it. I don't know why, possibly because of the, of the cash, I suppose, that was part of it. Um, City of Your Final Destination. Uh, I love this film. That's my most unknown film. And that's the, that's the film that I, I like to, to um, you know, I, I wish it were seen more and know, known better. Yeah. Uh, yeah, another... Um... Great, great. I, I very much enjoyed making that film. It was made after Ismail's death, though Ismail was involved at the beginning of, the beginnings of it, and he went with me to Argentina, Ismail did, um, in order to... We wanted to find locations and so forth, and and uh, but then then Ismail uh, became ill and died. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I always, you know, I, I made the I, I made the film anyway somehow, and I I, I went to uh, I, I went to Argentina to make it. It's it's a beautiful film, and you have Omar Metwali is the lead he's fantastic in it anthony hopkins you know he gave he gave a terrific performance laura linney right. gainsburg aleandro i mean you you put together this this magnificent <laughs> cast yeah they're great they're great no and i i, I really like that film and i i think it's uh, one of my very best films and it's a great pity that mo more people don't know it and haven't seen it yeah i agree because it was completed what in 20 2007 and it wasn't released uh, it, here no it, it, it doesn't it it wasn't really completed until 2009 about because we had to go down we had to go and do further work on it and we did we, we ran out of money on that film when we were we didn't have ismail around and uh had we had ismail around we would never run out of money but we did before we could quite finish it it was almost finished but not quite mm -hmm. and um so we had to, we had to find the money before we could go on, and, and and we had to add stuff. We had to add the the the, the scenes in North America in the snow and so on, and that kind of thing, and that, that had not been done. Um, and we now go to what I call classic Merchant Ivory. These next four films, you know what they are. Let's start with the Room of the View. Um, this was a huge hit, eight Oscar nominations, won three, twelve BAFTA nominations, your first director nomination. Uh, can you discuss how this project came about? And I know that um, the, the whole passage to India, you know, part of it. Um, can you can you speak a little bit about all of that? Sure. Well, um, A Room with a View, um, one of the reasons I wanted to make A Room with a View is I wanted to go back to in, being in, in, in Italy again. I, I, I loved Italy, but for like 20 years, while I was in India, making films in India or in Europe um, or in America, I never went, I never went back to Italy. And I just wanted to go to Italy again and that was one of the things that 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 drew me to that to that novel it gave me a chance to go back to Italy and um uh, I don't know we were it it wasn't that it wasn't that compli complicated to get the money for it I don't know why but we we did <laughs> so wow well and uh there there are two scenes uh, that I'm sure get talked about so much, but they stand out among so many standouts. And that's the the murder, the mesmerizing murder scene was extraordinary. And the nude swim is probably one of the most, uh, you know, famous scenes, certainly for gay men. <laughs> well, the mesmerizing murder, yes, that was, uh, um, yeah, that, that, that was... Uh, I remember doing that very well. We were in, in the Piazza Signoria in Florence, and and uh, it all worked out okay. And and uh, um, there was something in that, that that happened. There's a there's a moment in that that it was completely accidental. When the 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 the, the, the Italian boy who's been fighting is stabbed, and they bring him over towards the camera, 
and he's bleeding out of his mouth, like he's, he's about to die and he's bleeding out of his mouth. And he's brought head first, face up towards the camera. And just when he gets there, and it's a sight that probably people really wouldn't want to see. And I didn't, I didn't try to stop it. But someone, a, 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 an extra, moved his hand like that, as if to mask that sight. Oh, and wow. then took the hand away, by which time the face was gone. And I'm sure... I'm sure that extra with that, that hand is what got me my Academy Award nomination. <laughs> I was completely accidental. And um, wow, that's that's pretty amazing. That's amazing because well, that, that, that stands anyway, out. I, mean, I, I did other things in the film that I'm sure also got me the nomination, but but that but that was a, a, a just one of those 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 perfect accidents that happen sometimes in films that you have no control over they just happen and then they're they're absolutely what is wanted at that moment in time and so that happened and then the the nude frolicking you know you're you've always been great with nudity as something natural like even in heat and dust with just them laying on the bed you know i mean we we seem to be so puritanical, you know, here in the United States about things like well, that. I, I just decided I'm going to do, I'm just going to do what it's called for. And nobody had ever shot a male nude scene like that in, in, in a, you know, apart from pornography. And I thought, I'm just going to do it. And and uh, what is seen is seen. And, and so be it. And that's the way we shot it. Amazing. And people, people yeah, loved it. yeah, absolutely. The only, the only people who didn't love it was the airlines, and the airlines always tried to remove those shots, and we would fight them on that. And so sad because there's nothing really sexual about it. Oh. Um, which brings us to Morris, um, and uh, it was a rare film of its time because it was coming at the height of the AIDS pandemic, and it showed being gay and an ultimately accepting light which you know you didn't have to you didn't see you you didn't have to be miserable um it was pretty audacious for the uh, for this and and it followed your biggest success how how were you daring enough well, to it, say had it? A, it, it had a happy ending which was uh, which which Forster was the problem with Forster wrote uh, i don't know 1912 or 13 uh, when at the time that he was uh, terribly well known in writing his other novels and he wrote that uh, then but because it had a happy ending um it would it would have been considered it could not be published i mean it, um it, it just so he put it away and he kept that he kept the novel of morris his entire life and and many times he he was threatening to throw it away but his friends who'd read it said no you can't it's too wonderful you keep it don't throw it away and don't destroy it. And so he didn't. And then um, in then the British changed their 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 laws on what constitutes pornography and so forth, and what is acceptable to the public and what is not, and so on. They changed all that in the 60s, which then made it it, it was then possible for um uh, you could get away with much more at that point. And um in 1971, I think it was, um, it was finally published as, as a novel, right? And I read it then, and I liked it. And, and when I, I when I read it, uh, I did. I, I wasn't thinking of, of ever making it into a film or anything. But then, uh, many years had to pass before we we then attempted it as a film. But it seemed to me that it was the other side of the coin of a room with a view. And um, I mean, that it was really both stories, Morris and a room with a view are about people who are, uh, 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 or men who are going to make a terrible mistake, or men and women, they make a terrible mistake in their, about their love life and lie to themselves, not not do what they really want to do or, or go with the person they really uh, who loves them and they love, 
but to, to walk away from it. And that's, so they were going to live a lie um, for reasons of, you know, what, what is right and not, not, not right morally or anything, but just right to what would be acceptable to, to the public. And so the two of them are, they're, they're both like that. Both Very interesting. And, and Morris. They're, they're about people who are going to ruin their lives by lying to themselves. And that is really why I wanted to make it immediately following A Room with a View, which is, it tells the same story, but about a girl. This tells the story about two men. Amazing. Uh, and um, I want to ask about Rupert Graves as Scudder, uh, because it's a, <laughs> it's a remarkable performance, and it's a performance that doesn't get enough, I think, acclaim. Um, you had just worked with him on Room of the View. I think it was his first film. Did you always have him in mind for Scudder? No, no, I didn't. Uh, only when I met him. I mean, I did. I didn't know him. He was new to me, and I—I I mean, he was—you uh, know—he was, you know, he was uh, amongst the the boys that came to play. Uh, um, you know, Lucy Hunter's brother. Yeah. He was um, just one of many, but I liked him very much. I mean, he had great personality. And so. Yeah, I think it's a defining, you know, role for him. Um, and uh, Adrian Ross McGenty, I wanted to ask about <laughs> because he goes on to a major role in Howard Zen, but he had a very small role in the film. And then I noticed on the deleted scenes, he had an, originally had an interesting arc in the film. Um, could you speak a little bit about that? Well, well the film was very long. Uh, when, we, when we made Morris, it was, it was it, it, it just far too long. It, I mean, it, it wouldn't have been three hours and nobody was, you can't have a three hour film. Well, you, nowadays people do sometimes, but I mean, I couldn't. And um, yeah, so things went. Mm. I, uh, wonder what, I, I don't know what's happened to him lately. I don't know what he's been doing. Or, I mean, I he's think, an awfully good actor. I think I read that he's an entrepreneur now, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was acting for a little bit, and then he just went into some kind of business. Uh -huh. um, Howard's End, uh, nine well, there, Oscars. There he's in Howard's End, of course. So. Yeah, yeah, and he's fantastic in Howard's End. Um, let's talk about Howard's End. Let's talk about there's something so haunting and exquisite about this film, and it's for me, it's sense of karma. Um, can you tell me about the decision to adapt this particular Forster novel? Well, it, uh, it's, it's something that Ruth Ruth urged me to do, and she she always said, "There's a mountain you have to climb." And uh, before you finish with Forster, and um, so it was it was Howard's End, and so we, after making Room with a View and and Morris, it was there was that, and we did we did I think pretty much climb it. So. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, I mean, Emma Thompson wasn't that well known, and you cast her. And she was astonishing. And, you know, she shot the stardom and won the Oscar. Um, and I know it was her audition that hooked you because she read from the book. Is that true? Yeah, yeah she, she she read from the book. Uh, she, she didn't have the script with, with her. or she, I don't know what she'd done with it, but she didn't have it. And, or I didn't have one to give her to read. And she, but we had the novel there. And, and uh, this was in London. And she just read straight from the novel. And she she got it she got the the job on the spot. The moment she closed the novel, I said, "You're it." Incredible, uh, and you know Helena doesn't get enough credit for how she really comes into her own in this film. Yeah, she does. Yeah. Very much. Um, and I read that uh, Vanessa Redgrave was notorious for like not reading scripts or forgetting she committed to them, and that was the case here as well. Well, there were things like that. Um, the, the, those things did happen sometimes with Vanessa, but uh, no, I, 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 well, I can't remember, but exactly, is that what what the people say happens? That she, she 
Yeah, may have. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we were all we we're all set to do it. So, okay, this next film is my favorite James Irie film. Um, I think it's the closest to a perfect film as one can make, and it's the remains of the day. Hmm. Um, I I mean, eight Oscar nominations, your third directorial nomination, uh, second time working with Hopkins and Tom Thomas. I'm curious, did you guys just leave Howard's End and move directly to Darlington Hall? <laughs> uh, no, no, we didn't. And uh, Howard's, but it, it was almost like that. Yes, it was. Yeah. I, I, the, the, here's the thing about Remains of the Day. While we were making Mr. and Mrs. Bridge in Kansas City, there was an actor there, and I can't remember what what, what actor it was, but he one day on the set, one uh, it was like a Friday, I think, on the set, he handed me the paperback version of 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 that of the Remains of the Day, and he said, you know. Um, you you might like this. This this might be something for you. He said I I found it very boring, but you may like it. So I took it away and I read it over the weekend and I was just enchanted with it. I thought God I have to make this no matter what. And um, <clears throat> but it turned out that that uh, it had been the rights we didn't the the rights were not free, and uh, we had to. We had to wait a while before we could get the rights. Ultimately, we did get them. And as soon as they came free, then Columbia, it was a, 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 a picture of Columbia. Um, uh, they remembered that I had wanted to do it. They knew that I had wanted to do it. I had had a meeting with one of their executives and I said, if this ever becomes free, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like you to think of me. And when the rights did come free, they called me up immediately and said, "Well, it's free if you want. To, if you're still interested in doing it." And I said, "Yes, I am." And Ruth wrote the screenplay, but wasn't there uh, another screenplay written by Harold Pinter? There was. There was. And uh, as far as that goes, uh, Ruth said, "Well, I can't. I I can't." Uh, with some of the some of the scenes that Pinter had written, I can't improve on that. These are wonderful. That was, so, so uh, I guess well, I guess the screenplay belonged to Columbia also. So she, there there were things that she thought were excellent and not not to be improved with, and, and so she, we just put them in. Wow. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, this is a film about um, serving staff, a butler and a housekeeper, way before it was vogue to to go into their lives and see what their lives were like. You know, before Gosford Park, before Downton Abbey, right. I think, you you know, you were going into territory that just really wasn't wasn't done on the big screen. Well, it was done on the English big screen. There were plenty of movies about butlers and, you know, and all kinds of things. Yeah. But uh, you know, in, the, in, the, in old older English movies from the '30s and the '40s, I mean, butlers have a lot to do in that. In I, I think, though, what I meant was, not, for me, not as psychologically revealing. You know, I've seen a lot of those films, and well, for me, uh, of course, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, so R remains is ridiculously timely still today. Uh, you know, in terms of how good intentions can lead to disaster, it's one of the one of the frightening and and impression things about that movie yes it's true it's true yep uh, i wanted to ask you james uh you were nominated for best director three times uh i'm curious was there one time where you felt i i, I should have won that um yeah i found i should have won, won it for remains of the day i agree I agree. Lots of people, and they said that. Yeah. Um, okay. And speaking uh, to Oscar, I want to very briefly talk about uh, "Call Me by Your Name." Um, can you speak a bit about um, how adapting uh, Aikman's novel came about, uh, and how you were supposed to co-direct it? Well. Um, uh... Yeah, I, 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 I was meant to be a co-director with Luca Guadagnino, and it was his idea that I would be a co-director, and I 
I thought, well, why not? I mean, I I I liked the, I liked the novel very much. I read the novel. I I thought it was very good, and I liked the story. And and um, I thought, why not? But on the other hand, to co-direct something is it's a in a way you 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 were, you'd kind of be relieved if you didn't co-direct. I mean, if, if for, well, for instance, on on a set, what are the two directors? Have a disagreement. Who's going to give away? Give uh, who? Who will give way? Well, someone has to, and you you can't just sort of stand around and argue over it for hours or days. I mean, you have to decide immediately who's going to give away. And the person that gives away is then not the the good director. I mean, how does it work? So uh, it was just an awkward situation. But I said, when when they were thinking of that, I said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll go along with the idea, but I want my own screenplay. There had been a screenplay written, and I didn't think the screenplay did the book justice. And I said, I want to write my own screenplay. If I'm going to, if I'm going to direct it, then I have to have my own screenplay. And um, so they said, okay. And so I, I wrote it on spec. I wasn't being paid or anything. I I wrote it on spec, but, but then when they saw it, they liked it so much better than the screenplay that they had, that that's the screenplay they used. Mm. And, um, and that's why I am the screenwriter on that. Uh, that's the one they use. And, and um, um, well, that's, uh, that's how that came about. And, and, uh, but I, then Luca decided, uh, uh, it probably wasn't a good idea to have to have a co-director, and um, and so I was informed. It was one of those situations where um, you get a message that uh, that goes like this: "It has been decided that." Yeah. You know. Yeah. So it has been decided that. So well, that was okay. I didn't mind. Then they were they were. The, they wanted the screenplay in total and and uh, yeah well you and you wrote about it in your book too i'm curious has luca ever contacted you to explain any of this no 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 hi steven uh <laughs> um yeah. so uh you were very forthcoming about not being happy about the nudity being virtually removed and the sexual well, situations uh, uh, no uh, i well there, there was almost no nudity in it. There, there could have been a. I mean, there was. It wasn't like the nudity in my movies, and the, or the movie in the nudity in, in, in his. I, this, wait a second. This is. Sure. Yeah. It, 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 there wasn't any real nudity in it. Um, not, not like the nudity that you've seen in my my films, or that you've seen in in in, in Lucas films. But um, uh, it was just decided to, to do to, to shoot those scenes in a way that were I thought crude, and, and um, they could have they could have been done in a completely different way. I write about it in my book. Yeah, I, I, I read write it. what I think, I write what should have been, and um, but it wasn't. So I read your screenplay I never, too. I, I, I never discuss it with, with Luca. Mm. Well, did winning that Oscar, I, I feel like it was kind of vindication in many respects. Also, far too long coming, but uh, it had to have felt good because the best thing about Call Me By Your Name was the screenplay. Well, I liked that movie. I don't ever think I didn't like it. I, I thought uh, Luca did a really good job. I think, I mean, I, I liked all the actors and so on. But I, I, when I thought that I was going to be one of the directors, um, I had a different idea for the, who would play the mother. I wanted uh, I wanted Greta Skaki, oh. you know, for the mother. Yeah, and um, she, she was all. It has been decided that someone else would play it, who was very good. I had nothing against her, but uh, I liked her a lot. But but that was. It was one of the lacks for me. Hmm. Um, I want to very now briefly chat about some of your other films, starting with The Householder. 
um, and Shakespeare Walla to incredible films with Shashi Kapoor uh, early in his career uh, when he was, oh my God. Oh, not so early. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. Yes, it was early. I'm sorry. Yes, not it, was, it, it was not the first lead, I think, but almost the first lead. And Shakespeare Walla kind of um, was this surprise big hit and it, you know, pushed you guys further. Is that correct? Very much so, yeah. And the, the great thing was that that Satyajit Ray uh, composed the music for it. And that was a period when Ray was composing music for all of his own films. And he called Shakespeare Walla opus number 11, I think. <laughs> his, his opus <laughs> number 11. That's great. Um, want to talk a little bit about The Wild Party, because I think that film captures the period really well. It was the same year as Day of the Locust. Um, and I think that the mixed genres and styles work really well and were before its time. And I think that has to do with, you know, probably why it wasn't appreciated. Um, I, 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 I never quite understood why, why it wasn't, uh, people didn't want it, uh, why it was, it was never really, there, were, there was a, uh, some sort of mix up going on uh, in, in the studio that had the rights to it, and they just dropped it. It was one of those things that's uh, um, not enough, they, they, you know, they had screenings of it and the screenings weren't that successful, for the, they, so they just dropped it. And, and and that was the end of it. Wow. And then I, they recut it. I know. That, yeah. And so they, they not only dropped it, but they recut it. Um, and they put the recut version out to the public. Well, the public didn't like it. And eventually then uh, it, it was allowed to come out as I had in in my version. So I think it's a fact. And Jimmy Coco is. is Yeah, he's great. Yeah. Yeah. Perry King, King too. Was, Raquel was good. Very good. Yeah. Raquel gave you trouble, though. With, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I re read that in your book. She wasn't um, the easiest person in the world to work with, right? No, no, she wasn't. <laughs> uh, I want to briefly talk about Hullabaloo because it's it's very interesting how these two great actors who would go on to make a passage to India did such excellent work together in, in Hullabaloo. Um, working with the great Peggy Ashcroft, who, you know, was just incredible, and a really young Victor Banerjee. Uh, did, did, did you, I mean, I'm guessing they were your first choices? Well, for my film, yes, they were. Yeah. I mean, um, oh, yeah, they all were. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, yeah. Uh, Said, and then there was um, Banerjee, and yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if anybody's ever asked you, but um, you've seen, have you seen a Passage to India, the Lean film? Of course. And, and uh, what, what are your thoughts? You, um, Lean was the kind of English um, Englishman in India that forced her despised and that he that he wrote about it in so many of his novels a, a, a kind of englishman uh, you could say unthinking brutal um a version of wilcox in howard's end and he was he was that kind of a man he was not he was not a forsterian sort of director and it shows in his movie i think Interesting. Um, Heat and Dust, though, was your—I don't want to say version of a passage in India, but it did—it did, it did uh, hit on some of the same themes. And but we had... were offered passage to India to make. Ah, we were offered. Yes, we were. I mean, Ismail and I were in London, and we had a message one day from King's College at Cambridge, who uh, and who. Um, the, they they had the rights to uh, to that to that to passage to India and they asked us to come up for lunch. So Ismail and I went up to Cambridge and had lunch at King's College, and they and and they indeed did offer passage to India to us to make, 
if we wanted it. But we had just made Heat and Dust, and Heat and Dust was still playing, and it was a huge success, and it was still playing in the theaters in, in London. So I said, and Ismail said, well, you know, actually, we don't want to make uh, Passage to India. What we'd really like to make is, is, um, um, is, um, Room in the okay. View? Yeah, or, sorry. Well, we, what we, 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 we would really like to make Room with a View. And they said, that little novel, why, who would want to, why, why do you want to make Room with a View if you can make Passage to India? And we said, well, we just do. That's what we want to do. So they thought about it and they said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny how A Room with a View is a film, I, you know, that's ultimately about a, an empowering, a, an empowering woman. And right, right before that, you had Heat and Dust with Julie Christie and Greta Skaki, who, which was also about, well, it's about how women are mistreated, but, you know, I think the Julie Christie character kind of, you know, rises above that. And then you did the Bostonians, and that ending with Vanessa Redgrave was all about women being empowered. So I feel like you have, like, three films there in a row that were, you know, kind of well, almost... They would, all, they would all be appreciated by Ruth Jodvala. Because she was a powerful woman. You wouldn't think that. I mean, she never speak up or anything, but she she certainly was powerful. I see that in her work. Um, I wanna I wanna quick ask you about surviving Picasso because I think it's a terrific film and Natasha McAhone in particular. I don't understand why she wasn't recognized for awards. Well, I, I think it was a it it was was a, a a film about which a great man, uh, Picasso, uh, is seeing it doesn't seem all that great because of his, his relations relationships with women. He's rather rather tough on women, and so the heroism. It's so the same thing that happened with Jefferson in Paris. Both uh, Thomas Jefferson and Picasso were are great you know, great heroes. And uh, in both of them, the, their relations with women are shown to be a bit uh, less, you know, not quite right. One is, one, one is uh, uh, his, you know, he, he has a slave girl who, that is, is his lifelong mistress and so on. That just didn't appeal to people because this, these were films that, that somehow brought down the heroes. Hmm. And and one after one after the other. I mean, first first uh, um, uh, for, for, first with with uh, Jefferson in Paris, and then with 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 Picasso. I mean, it, uh, Picasso was the next film. Yeah. So twice we had done that. It's unfortunate I because think that, I think that is really what happened. That we were seen to be. In some kind of way, demeaning great men who were great heroes, and yet you were presenting. I think if those films were made today, they would be a lot more accepted. Oh, probably, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. we're all about presenting flaws now, you know, especially men. Uh, I and speaking of, oh my God, this is a good transition. I wanted to ask you about your because on the Golden Bowl. Uh, you had an unfortunate relationship with Harvey Weinstein. Can you tell us a little bit about about that and about how you got your movie back from him? Um, we bought it back. We simply bought it back. We gave him back his money. And which was, I think, the stupidest thing that Merchant Ivory ever did was to actually do that. But we we that's what we did. We, I think we had to pay him $4 million and was somehow... Isabel came up with that. He had it lying around, I guess. And then then it belonged to us and still does. And this was because he wanted to recut it? He wanted to recut it and do all sorts of awful things to it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, Le Divorce is uh, the last movie I want to talk about. Uh, it's an incredible cast. You had Naomi Watts, Kate Hudson, the great Leslie Caron, again, you know, working with these amazing actors you had glenn close that you finally worked with that you were trying to work with for quite a while there right. um, 
Th this is a film that I felt worked really, really well. Uh, you, you know, again, you had two great French ac actors who would go on to great acc acclaim, Melville and Romain. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how that Diane Johnson adaptation came about? Um, well, I read it when it came out and I read it and I thought, well, th this really suits me. I'd like, and at, at this point we, um, we also had an apartment in Paris by then and we were living there and, um, uh, off and on. And I thought it would be be great to make because we could be doing another film in Paris. I I, I love working in Paris. It's it's um, you know really enjoyable. So I just um, immediately we we uh, tried to get the rights and did get them. And James, then made it. Yeah, it, uh, James Fox said you were one of the greatest watchers and listeners in of the world and rupert graves called you a proper collaborative director i i feel like i like hearing these things i wish i wish i hadn't waited so long to say it but anyway <laughs> well but i i feel like there's this um when when actors look back on working with you it's because you were so collaborative it was because you were so wanting to hear what they yeah. had to say exactly. and not all not all directors are like that jim i know that i i and, and that has always been my method uh i feel that that actors um usually uh, with a part if they're really serious actors are good, good and talented they they're they're drawing that up somehow out of, from, of their most inner most inner depths of their of their being that that characters they put it together and they know it better almost than anybody and I would just wait to see what they're going to do and I rarely have any interest in sometimes I I, I have to move people in different ways but. But if it's a really great actor or actress, I let them show me what it is they they have planned, and um, and that's not only true of the actors; it's true really of the of the set designers, and it's always true of Ruth. I, I want to see what they what they're coming up with. With they have this problem; it's a story, a particular kind of story, and set in a particular place. So there's sort of basic thing. And what what have they done with it? I want to know what they've done with it. And that's that's what that is what collaborative working is. I think. I have a question. Crazy I want to ask. jump in and say no. I don't want that. And before they've even told you what it is, they that they they thought up. I mean, that's just insane. Yeah. Oh, I have a question. I want to ask for all of your great admirers and fans in the audience and it's asked out of love why hasn't there not there why has there not been a james ivory feature since city of your final destination well i am getting sort of old <laughs> you know? i mean i made that in my 80s you don't seem it <laughs> well i may not seem it but i mean and also it's, it's almost impossible for somebody as old as i am to get insured you know, you have to, you, you, you know, they, they probably think I'm going to go out there on the set and drop dead or something. <laughs> I remember R Billy Wilder had a hard time. He couldn't make another film after Buddy Buddy. Um, you and know, how I, old was he? I think he was in his late 70s at that time. Right. Yeah, yeah they, they don't, they, they, they really don't want to insure you. And I so by that, by the time that I had made the city of final destination, and and also, Ismail was gone, and and um, somehow, I don't know, I just didn't. I mean, I felt I'd done enough, really. And, <laughs> but I have done another film recently. I made a I made a do, a documentary. Cooler the, climate. Cool. Yeah, it's a wonderful documentary. Oh, you've seen it. Yes. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. Um, and and I hi highly recommend it, James. 
has there been, um, and it, I know this is like trying to choose children. It's an unfair question, but was there one actor that you just remember was such a, a delight to work with? Well, Shashi. Yeah, always, always. Yeah. Nice. Um, I'm, I'm, I have one more question for you. What are you, uh, what are you doing now? What are you currently working on? What's going well, on? Well, I'm writing things. I'm also involved in an, in, in a, in an exhibition that's going to be at the, uh, that, that we're doing at the Metropolitan Museum of Indian drawings. <laughs> and, um, and I'm writing stuff and, you know, I, um, uh, I keep busy. But for heaven's sakes, I am 95, you know, I shouldn't have to, I don't think <laughs> I should be expected to do anything other than just to pontificate and smile benignly. And that's, that's perfect. And here's Steve, Steve and Susie just popped in. Say hello, Stephen. Hey. <laughs> Stephen, is there anything hey you want to add to all of this as uh, the director? He's had plenty of, of time to ask everything he ever wanted. Merchant Ivory, yeah. <laughs> I yes I um yes I had many more hours than you you've had Frank but um no I mean it's just you know I I mean Jim is still um you know Jim before you got on the call I mentioned that you were just you know in Italy and you were in Paris again and I mean it's just so inspiring to see and you know just well there to... in Italy in Italy I, I was the subject of a film yeah. Yeah. I, I, there, uh, the main, uh, 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 a director, Christopher Manning, who lives in Paris, is making a kind of, uh, I don't know, a, a film about me, who, who I am and what I am. It isn't about Merchant Ivory, really. Merchant Ivory comes into it, but it's mainly me. So, wow, yeah. I look forward to that. Yep, there's, uh, yeah, but um, no, and I mean, it's also nice to hear you know, Jim's, you know, just talk to you about, you know, things that are in, in my film as well, you know, um, Jefferson and Paris and surviving Picasso. And so, um, yeah, so again, so from my perspective, I'm just very, I'm thrilled that I was able to, you know, to, to interview Jim the five or six times that I did and that we have that footage. And I mean, we have so much more and, you know, and I mean, that's one thing that... Well, well, while I was watching, not to interrupt Stephen, but while I was watching, yeah. I thought this could be a three-hour, a four-hour documentary. Will will that ever? Will that footage ever <laughs> see the light of day? Yeah, um, Cohen Media didn't want a three or four-hour documentary film. I'm um, sure, well, and I don't but, blame them. <laughs> but but yeah, so so the film is an hour and 51, 52 minutes, whatever. But um, but but what's incredible is that I do have all of these interview assets that I've, de I've pitched to Cohen to make sure that they include them on the DVD releases. And, you know, we'll figure out, I mean, there has to be a place for this footage. Again, who, I mean, Jim, I have, I I've edited down interviews that I have with Jim, you know, that maybe we get, you know, five minutes from that interview in my film, but there's another 30 30 minutes mm. and 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 so and because I did interview Jim five six times um and you know also Emma Thompson maybe we get a couple minutes of Emma Thompson in my film I've got a 27 minute edited down version of my interview with Emma and a, and a long Helena Bonham Carter interview and so yeah there's there's a lot more um you know content that we just kind of need to figure out how to, you know, share it, but. Sure. And, and for Jim, all of these questions you get asked over and over again, and, you know, it's like answering over and over again. I'm curious, is there one thing that you've ever wanted to dispel or, you know, just set the record straight on that, you know, nobody's ever asked you about? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell I'm me. I'm not English. I'm not English. I'm American. <laughs> I'm from Oregon. That's what I want people to know. I love it, and that's that's. I'm a sure great... I'd, I'd be proud to be an Englishman if I was an Englishman. I'd be, you know, proud of that. But the fact is, I'm not English. I'm American. Please remember that. 
Well, that's that's a perfect place to stop here. I want to <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I want to I yep. want to thank you, James Ivory, again, a director that I feel, you know, I mean, you de you deserve your place in the Pantheon. You just do. So th that is that is happening. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you, James. Thank you.